second speaker. Frederick Hoskin grew up in Nazi Germany, coming to the United States in 1961 as the recipient of a Fulbright scholarship. She currently lives in Hanover, New Hampshire. Her talk is entitled, Who Resisted the Nazi Regime? And there will be time for questions after. This topic is very relevant to the great colloquium's year-long consideration of citizenship. In our summer reading, we saw four sisters answer the question, what is my responsibility to my country and my family in response to the evils of the Trujillo regime? Three of those sisters made a choice that resulted in their death. In September, we heard John Adams reflect on a very courageous choice he made as a citizen to help lead the rebellion against the British that would have probably cost Adams his life if the colonists had been unsuccessful. Today, we will have the chance to reflect on a horrible moral situation that Germans and citizens of other European nations faced in the 1930s and the 1940s. What to do in the face of the evils of the Nazi regime. Thank you very much, Reverend Hoskins, for, Hoskins, for joining us today.
customary Hitler girl uniform as all 10 year olds did. White shirt, black skirt, brown velvet jacket, a black tie clasped together with a leather knot, a black beret. Oh, so cool. I was never going to take it off and I wore it the next morning to church. As I entered the sanctuary, a woman rushed toward me, shook me and screamed, don't you know you cannot wear this get up in church? It's from the devil. I was terrified back to the door as another woman came towards me, embraced me and said, please stay. Just take off your array and your tie and come and worship. To the one who had accosted me, she said, she doesn't know. What was it that I didn't know? It surely spelled confusion. In hindsight, I learned that this interchange reflected the church at war with itself. The word is Kirchenkampf, battle within the church. Hitler himself had no religion other than himself. But he was clever enough not to do away with the church, but to harness the devoutness and loyalty of German Christians for his own purpose. He appointed a vice bishop, a state bishop, who sat in the chancery for church affairs along with the rest of the government. His name was Ludwig Müller. He had been an army chaplain and was neither capable nor worthy of a position like this. Still, the idea of a nationalistic, the emphasis on nationalistic, not just national, church, had appealed, and its followers called themselves Deutsche Christen, German Christians. Soon, the German Christians solidified into an organization. Their main intention was to rid the church of anything that could be considered un-German and rally churchgoers around the principles of patriotism and Hitler loyalty. Here are a few points of their program. The National Church demands immediate cessation of the publishing and dissemination, dissemination of the Bible. The Führer, the title Germans used to refer to Hitler, the leader, Der Führer, his book Mein Kampf is of all documents the greatest and embodies the purest and truest ethic. It must be placed on the altars of the German churches. The National Church will clear away from its altars all crucifixes, Bibles, and pictures of saints. The Christian cross must be removed from all churches and be superseded by the unconquerable symbol, the swastika. It may be hard to believe, I can hardly catch my breath as, as I ponder this, but there were those who wanted to create a seamless connection between national socialism and Christianity, the link of Germanists to being Christian. A few more, more excerpts from the manifesto of the Deutsche Christen, and I will refer to this Deutsche Christen now, so you will remember it is an organization and not gener generically referring to Christians in Germany. Um, we aim to foster the reawakening German sense of identity against godless Marxism and defeatist relying on un-German practices. We understand race and nationhood as God-given orders and oppose any form of racial mixing. Keep 
our race pure. Now, what to do about the obvious Jewish roots in biblical teachings? The answer, Germanness is defined inherently in opposition to Jewishness. So we have to purge all texts and traditions of everything Jewish. They took a cut and paste attitude to the Bible. The Old Testament was mostly ridiculed or ignored. The New Testament portrayed Jesus as an Aryan hero. One sat satirical comment was, when they get through with Jesus, he will be a goose-stepping, blue-eyed liberator of the Germans. In the story where Jesus cleanses the temple of the money changers and of the peddlers of the sacrificial animals, Jesus calls the temple the den of thieves. The clearly anti-Semitic Deutsche Christen called this den of thieves the Kaufhaus, that's Kaufhaus, the department store. That need to be cleansed of, of thieves. Department stores were mostly owned by Jews. The Aryan clause in this manifesto decreed that non-Aryans, Christians of Jewish origin, origin, could not be ordained into the Christian ministry. And a little later, the non-Aryan clergy had his or her ordination report. This is what else they said. Our mission does not consist of charity or compassion for the undeserving. Rather, we demand protection for the people from the unfit and the inferior. The needy were unfit and inferior. The unfit and the inferior, inferior were eliminated, including people with disabilities who were considered useless eaters, communists, members of unions, and homosexuals. Books were burned and so-called deranged art and artists destroyed and killed, as we all know. And six million Jews were exterminated. How could we not know? Again, the childhood memory. One day, a fancy trunk appeared in my grandmother's kitchen, belonging to Frau Simon, as we soon realized. The Simons owned the local butcher shop. My grandmother, with a large family, was a good customer of the Zimon butchery and also a friend. The Zimons were Jewish, as you might guess. Paul Zimon entered the kitchen, approached the trunk, and lifted the lid. Out came fancy lace, linens, silver, and other treasures. It is yours, she said. Take it. We won't need it where we are going. There were tears and hugs and mournful goodbyes. Where, where were they going? I was confused, but there was a dawning, a beginning dawning that something had gone awry. One of the first presidents of the new Germany after World War II said, it follows that we Germans should suffer collective guilt forever. However, the next generations to follow may not buy into this guilt feeling. So I propose the best way not to forget is to always have a sense of collective shame. Collective shame. Knowing or not, active participation or not in the unspeakable horrors 
many a German to this day lies into this collective shame. As we now know, the Deutsche Christen were not unopposed, thanks to some courageous, intelligent, passionate Germans. Scholars, church people, landowners, nobility, and even members of the military. Names that conjure up the greatest admiration among people all over the world. And soon the resistance began to make some inroads. In September of 1933, the Deutsche Christen National Synod was held in Berlin. 80% of the delegates wore the brown shirt of the Nazi uniform, so it became known as the Brown Synod. There was some opposition among the delegates, but they were shouted down to advance the Nazi agenda. Two days later, a group of the opposition met at Martin Niemeyer's house. Martin Niemeyer, a pastor in Berlin. They concluded that the Deutsche Christen had clearly broken away from the Christian tradition and something needed to be done. Martin Niemeyer himself was first reluctant to stand up, but then became a strong member of the resistance. His words have become a banner for other resistance movements. This is what he said. First, they came for the socialists, and I did not speak out because I'm not a socialist. Then they came for the trade unionists, and I did not speak out because I was not a trade unionist. Then they came for the Jews, and I did not speak out because I'm not a Jew. And then they came for me, and there was no one left to speak for me. Theologian Karl Marx has written volumes and volumes of theology, was thrown out of Germany because he raised his voice against the Nazis. Nazis. And he is now, a, or became then, a theology professor in, in Basel, Switzerland. Resisting church leaders sought out his counsel. At first he himself wondered that the risk was too great. But then he became one of the framers of the proclamation of the uprising in the church. Von Hoeffer, the pastor in Berlin, a bit more about him a little later. You cannot board it, he said, you cannot board a train that is heading for disaster and hope to escape by just running on the train in the other direction. At a rally, the Deutsche Christen celebrated the people's decision to leave the League of Nations in their favorite arena, the Berliner Sports Park. Banners carried the slogan, Ein Reich, Ein Volk, Eine Kirche. One nation, one people, one church. One speaker led to the podium and in crude and coarse language demanded that every German pastor must take an oath of personal allegiance to Hitler. Now, that followed by quite a bit of shock and outrage among Germans and gave momentum to the resistance. Karl Barth, Martin Niemöller, and Dietrich Bonhoeffer called on the churches to stand up. Many individuals, local churches, and church leaders heeded the call, and the confessing church was born. He bekennen de Kirche, bekennen meaning to make a statement of identity with consequential commitment. At their first synod in Barmen in May of 1934, the confessing church ratified the Barmen Declaration the statement of faith for the new German evangelical church. Its preamble, Jesus Christ as revealed in Holy Scripture, is the only word we are to hear, to follow and to trust, both in life and in death. We reject the false teaching that we belong to any other Lord than to Jesus Christ. 
We reject the former's teaching that the state can determine the order and the mission of the church and hold to the faith that in being the body of Christ, we live our God's grace for all people. Outstanding as a theologian who would undergird and live the Bauman Declaration was Dietrich Bonhoeffer, pastor and professor in the underground seminary for a brief period, teacher at Union Theological Seminary in New York, widely traveled and respected. He was also a member of the conspiracy that together with Defense Minister Wilhelm Canales and military commander Paul von Hase participated in the violent Mueller plot, the assassination attempt on Hitler's life which failed. Justice Department member Hans von Dochmanni had compiled files of the Nazi Einsatzgruppen atrocities in Eastern Europe. The secret fire called the Chronicles of Shame were discovered after the failed assassination attempt on July 40, 1944. And all whose names appeared in these files were executed, including Friedrich Bonhoeffer, who was hanged in April of 1945, a few months before the Nazi regime collapsed. A fairly recent biography of Dietrich von Hofer is subtitled Pastor, Martyr, Prophet, and Spy. He indeed has shaped modern theology all over the world. He today speaks to and for religious people who clearly see their responsibility in the public arena. There are two poems that I'd like to share with you. The first one is, Who Am I? He argues with the perception others have of him. Some say he's courageous and calm and frenzy and proud and patient. And he asks, am I not struggling for breath, yearning for color, thirsting for kindness, powerless, trembling, weary, empty, and faint. And now to the last lines. Who am I, this or the other? They mock me, these lonely questions of mine. Whoever I am, thou knowest, O oh God, I am thine. And another, written shortly before his death, Giving it to you in German first. Von guten Mächten wunderbar geworden, erwarten wir getrost, was, was schauen wir. Gott ist mit uns am Abend und am Morgen und ganz bestimmt an jedem neuen Tag. While the powers of good aid and tend us, boldly we face the future, come what may. At even and at morn, God will befriend us. Almost surely on each newborn day. These and his other writings are now part of the German cultural heritage among the young and among the not so young. How about the resistance of the young? Do I have a few more minutes to talk about that? Yep. yep. Um, it is not difficult, as you might imagine, to engage the young generation with idealistic, nationalistic, self-congratulatory propaganda, with marches and uniforms and sports and graduation and pageantry in the history. But there were a few who resisted the shameless abuse. One was Sophie Scholl, who together with her brother Hans and others distributed pamphlets against the Nazis at the University of München, where they were students. They belonged to the group called Device Rose, the White Rose, and called for a clear rejection of the regime and to strive for a renewal of the deeply wounded German spirit. 
She and her brother were executed in February of 1943. She was 22 years old. The first chapter of the book that I brought, the, the Rising of the Country Content shows a picture of Sophie Shaw. And it's chronicles the lives of the resistors under, under 30 years of age. And one of the young people says in this book, I quote her, don't speak of me as a hero. I have been overcome by death, but you, you must have courage to live. Albums, albums of those and books of those who were felt in the resistance were distributed, published by the government in 1950, and distributed to schools, youth groups, churches, and families at no cost to raise awareness <coughs> of the brave struggles of the resistance, encourage the young to never let it happen again. In the midst of guilt and shame, all be they justified, it was crucial for the national healing that the young could identify in some Germans who deserved to be honored. I wish we had time to remind you all how much the Americans helped for Germans to get back on their feet and back to find their right mind. You did. Now what does this all have to do with you, my dear young people? No one wants to put you the anguish and the suffering this particular resistance, or of the Mirabel sisters opposing the military government in the Dominican Republic, reported in the time of butterflies, the book you have been reading. But what can you do? Join the Occupy Wall Street protesters? Why we believe that their cause is just and are sensitive to that cause and support it, most of us are not there. And in my head, I even argue with them, and you may too. However, your place is right here now, and I expect to take full advantage of the opportunities afforded. You listen and learn. A sign was spotted at an Occupy Wall Street rally. In fact, it also appeared on the Dartmouth campus where I live. And Gary Trudeau had a spin on it in his Bloomsbury strip. You have seen it, I'm sure. It said, we will believe corporations are people when Texas executes one. <laughs> Now well, there are some who do not understand the sign because they do not know or do not want to know what the Supreme Court decided regarding campaign financing. They are not aware of the landscape of capital punishment in America. They do not argue with corporate behavior. But you do and you are. What's your reaction? What are your arguments? What would you do if you could change something? You are here to learn and to discern. And this is such a good place for that. And when your time comes, vote, vote, vote. I'm closing with a quote from Eli Wiesel, who was part of your curriculum, I see. I swore never to be silent whenever and wherever human beings endure suffering and humiliation. We must always take sides. Neutrality helps the oppressor, never the victim. Silence encourages the tormentor, never the tormented.
What was the pur purpose of wearing the uniform? Yes. It was to be identified as a Hitler girl, to create the sense of uh, belonging and community. All the Hitler organizations had uniforms. The SS, the SR, the SS Black, the SS Black, the SR Brown, the boys and the boys had brown uniforms, and the Hitler girl was working with Alice She It was a strong point of being identified. Was well, it a stigma if you did not wear it? I, I guess so. It was just not an honor. It was, an honor. It was like a purity right. <laughs> family next to 
us whose name was Israel, and all of a sudden they uh, adopted 